Hi, gorgeous. Oh my god. How you doing? I'm good. Good Lynn. to see you. Good to see you. Look at you. <laughs> Beautiful boy. I haven't seen you for such you? a long time. My baby brother. Where are you? <laughs> my baby brother's bigger than me now. <laughs> How are you? Man? Uh, Pretty good. Oh good my god, you look exactly you. the same. Wow. Yeah. Hey, what's, what's going on? on? <laughs> so what have you been Pretty up cool. to, man? All oh, kinds of stuff. Yeah? Yeah. So <laughs> crazy to see everybody. <laughs> What's yeah, that? that's what I mean. Oh they're, my doing, God. Yeah. they're big. Too. How old are they? How old are they? My daughter's 13 and my son's 11. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Wow, it's so weird to, to see it. It's so funny. It's, so, it's <laughs> crazy. It's been a while. This is so weird to set you up over here. Okay. When the three children showed up, it was like they were my kids and they'd been away at school. Yeah. You do? Yeah. You do? I well, remember certain things. I, I like them, which is the best feeling a parent can have about children. And making a movie is being a parent of something. And this is that thing you were talking about. Cut to that. You don't have to read. Oh, to, you have yeah, that, too. Isn't I think. that amazing? She saved it all. Wow. <laughs> hey, that's the bomb. <laughs> and these are the <laughs> missiles. Yes. Says the war is bad on it. War is bad. <laughs> so great. <laughs> it's so cool that you kept this stuff. And it's funny seeing myself so young. Oh, <laughs> 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 your ties. <laughs> we all are so young. Little. I had the biggest crush on you too. I was. She was like the <laughs> older woman. She. How old were you? Even? I was 14, 13, 14. Four, and I was five, and she. I was like, oh. And she would. She would spend so much time with me. She was always like. Yeah, he was my know. baby brother. <laughs> it was, and I would well, go over to your house and I stuff. I know, and your family would come over to her, yeah. like my family's house. And, and you were my first crush after kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> I found this amazing story, Testament. It was called The Last Testament. Um, and once I was, I had the courage of the material. I had the, I had, I believed that the story should be made. I received a proposal from three producers of the same story within the same week, and I thought, whoa, which got me to read it very quickly. It was a tiny little story, and at the bottom of the article in the magazine it said, Carol Amon lives in Sunnyvale, California. So as an old reporter, I called information in Sunnyvale, California, got Carol Amon on the phone, said, I love your story. Um, would you consider letting me make this film? So I called the other two um, and said how much I'd enjoyed the story and what were their plans for this to be a movie. And they all went, well, yes, we, uh, uh, we have an option. We've talked to the author. And they all said, we've talked to the author. When I sent it to Lindsay Law at American Playhouse, um, I was apparently the seventh or eighth person who submitted the story. Luckily, he said, why should I give it to you? And you said, shall I send you a copy of the contract and the canceled check? <laughs> and I thought, well, this woman knows what she's doing. What I found out about the writer of Testament was that she woke up in the middle of the night, had this dream, got out of bed, wrote this whole story down, and went back to sleep. And that in, in fact, the story reads like a dream. It, it reads like something that rushed out of somebody and that has, it's all of a piece, and that is a sort of nightmare. Um, and it was clearly her nightmare. It certainly was mine. Um, and Jane Alexander talked about the fact that it was her nightmare. My son Jace read this story, and he said, Mom, you know, this is your nightmare. This is your story of the three of us. There were three, three of the four boys in my nightmare going on a camping trip and then not being able to get back to our home because of radiation coming from the sky. And so I read the story and I said, oh boy, it is a powerful story, Carol A. Men's story. And, and then you called. I had no idea the sequential nature of, of filmmaking. I mean, it, it, and in fact, it is a series it's of, of, of sequential love affairs. Um, you become dependent, involved, and you, linked to one person at a time, one gift at a time. Starts with the writer. John Young's name was given to me by three separate people. What I remember mostly was that 
I was very busy. I had no time to do it. Uh, and literally was looking for every reason to say no, I think partly out of not exactly fear of the material, but there was a certain danger sign going off about it. I was terrified because it's, it's literally, you, you're handing over control. You're handing over your dream. It's a little bit like diving into a, into a, you know, a, a lake or an ocean and having no idea where the bottom was. And once you're in there, it was just sort of how, how deep can you go, how dark is it going to get, and can I stand it? We then proceeded to have, John and I, a quite interesting contentious relationship. Um, the script had to be delivered by a certain date, and unlike Hollywood, dates in public television are not movable. You either hit the date or you don't get the money. The process of writing was that the first 13 or 15 pages, really through the time that Tom, Tom, Tom goes to San Francisco, was very difficult. The date was Monday. Friday afternoon, he had 41 pages written. And I went in and had, he didn't remember a thing. When I spoke with him, he remembered none of this. I wrote for three and a half days without stopping. He gave me the keys to his office. And, and, and in the course of the weekend, this is when people still worked with typists, he put pages out, four pages out every six hours under the door. So the next 65 pages were written in three and a half days. By the end of the weekend, we had a complete script, and it went in an envelope. None of which I remember, see, so. Come on, Tom. What do you say, Lyre? Love the rope, Cynthia. Sierra Madre was a sleepy little town right next to uh, the Santa Anita racetrack, sort of across the freeway from it. It hadn't really been used as a film location for quite a few years. This was 1983, so uh, it wasn't a popular place. It was basically very... Uh, low-budget film friendly. We had these incredible uh, tasks to do. We didn't have the money to do it. Everybody, whether it was a grip, whether it was a set dress, everybody did everybody's thing. If there was a need, if something had to be done, everybody stepped in. Hey! You don't understand. Hey, you! You! I want you out of that line. There are other people waiting for gas. It was an amazing experience. From the very beginning, when we were in our office, we hadn't started, it was pre-production. We decided we needed to do research. We needed to bring reality. What was it that the government was telling all the people to do to prepare? And we got pamphlets from the Civil Defense Department where they were telling us that in case of a nuclear bomb, cover your windows with plywood and don't drink your milk or your water for about three days and then it would all be fine. In the early 80s, the country was terrified um, that they could be obliterated through the, the, the enormous fears of the Cold War, which, again, like so many things, when time moves swiftly, people forget that. The milk tastes funny. It's warm. When's our refrigerator going to work? Doesn't radiation get into cows? We'll use powdered milk. Your dad has all that stuff. We were in that house together. It was as if we were all going through that horrible holocaust of radiation poisoning together. I was so freaked out. I would hear a, a you know, an airplane at night, like in LA, you know, oh, going God. over the, you know, going over and I was like, is that, is that a nuclear bomb? You thought bomb? it was it. Yeah. You know, I would, I would get like scared. I would wait till it would go over and then I'd be like, all right, it's okay. Oh, Scotty! The line between what you were asking him to do, pretend to do, and what he was doing, he couldn't determine. And he said, you know, I'm not really a bad boy. They told me to do that. <laughs> and he had to make it clear that if he had done this at home, he might have been a bad boy. But he was doing it on the set, and he was being asked to do it. And here was this little mind grappling with a very big issue, actually. Little Lucas was the key for me. He was like, the minute he said, oh, I know, Dad got nuked in San Francisco, wasn't anything to laugh about, but it was like, okay, now we can all work and make the same film. Working in a real house for me was a salvation because it was closer to documentary. I mean, we'd gone into somebody's house and we're shooting in the house. I think the real people kept living there. We left them a bedroom. Well, I'd done documentary films for 20 years. When you get used to listening to real people tell their stories, in fact, you go for that same thing from actors. 
you can tell when they're not telling the truth. And acting is not that. Acting is telling the truth. Jane held the whole cast together. She has a kind of calm um, that is professional and yet not distancing. So she took care of the children and she took care of herself. You know what I would do in the morning? I don't know if I ever told you this. We would start pretty early, as you remember. But in order to get a kind of peace of mind in Zen, I would often go to the Santa Anita racetrack at dawn because the horses would be coming out to exercise. And it was very beautiful and very peaceful. <laughs> and then I'd come over to the set. Through the book, what do you what do you most remember most fondly about shooting Tessa? I was so thin then. <laughs> the um, the group that you brought together was unique in that everybody that was there because they wanted to work on this film. We discussed the vision of the film. We were both aware that if a film this um, serious were not beautiful, it, they, it would be unbearable. You came to me and said, you know, I've been thinking about this and I think we need to, to start colder and uh, uh, think of the uh, end of the movie as the twilight of the earth. It made perfect sense, especially in terms of what David Nichols was doing with the browning of Sierra Madre. He painted those trees brown as they died. The trick here was that this is a fantasy, this is fiction, this is, is it science fiction? It is something that has never happened, but the approach was rather than special effects, and think now how you would probably be mandated to do this, was a plainness. I had to come up with a way to create the nuclear blast. We put a big clea light on the lawn and I built shutters for the Klee light that could open the light exploding in the room. The entire film was storyboarded. Every single scene, every gesture was there in my book. I think out of 22 days, it rained 18 of those days. It was so appropriate to the movie in terms of the quality of light, that, that dank overcast, heavy overcast light, kind of, you know, nuclear winter. Bill? Bill? Oh, they, they said we should conserve wood. We had a tiny box, but it wasn't big enough. We didn't have a bureau the right size. So you gave this to me. See? It's got tongue groove. It's real antique. Yeah. I remember reading the script and being um, so taken with it, so a powerful experience that way. I mean, the audience will experience the movie. I experienced the script. And, um, and I, uh, while there wasn't a, a, a large part for me, nor did I probably deserve one, the, the, the thing that stood out to me was that um, if I was going to be a part of film, this is the kind of film that I wanted to be a part of, big or small. William Devane was quite difficult. We did have one confrontation. He was hiding upstairs in the bedroom in his underpants. And I walked in and I said, why are, you, why are you doing this to me? Why are you giving me such a rough time? You've been on 400 more sets than I have. You have much more experience than I have. I said, but, but I know about this script better than you ever will. Yes, right. Mommy. My God, look at the size of that dandruff, huh? Here's a kiss. Bye, Rat. Bye, Madam Director. He gave an absolutely perfect performance. For me, the most profound day was 
um, when my character has to ask her mother because she knows she's dying and that um, an experience that she will not have in her life is being able to connect with a man and, and have sex or make love. What's it like? <laughs> when you love someone, you want to be as close to them as you can get. You make love and you feel almost like the same body. Like it was intended. You have a space and that person fills it up. That's something I'm never gonna forget. Like that's really special and amazing and um, it's a kind of thing as an actor that you like look for in every job that you do when you have that, that connection with another actor and a connection with the material and a connection with a deep moment. and. And every single person for years would come up to me and say, I'll never forget that scene where you're asking about making love. It, sure. it, that broke me. What I wanted to convey in the music, the, my ideas as I remember were very, very simple and had to work very, very elegantly and quietly in the background and couldn't twist an audience for tears. It just had to be doing the right thing all the time. And there's certain orchestral colors which in my mind, do those functions with before I even write one note. Hi, Bob. I very much wait to see the finished film, and then I react to that. So sometimes I've gotten into the most insane discussions with directors who talk in terms of opera and talk in terms of other stuff which they don't really know about, but it makes them think they're communicating. How do I talk to him about what I will like or not like? Do I, I mean, I have a, I have a musical education, but what's, what are the limits? What, what are his, what are his creative requirements? It's so much easier to just not think in those kind of terms, but just think in just dramatic storytelling. What is it you need to say? Do I agree? The more chances I take with a film score, the more I want the director to be involved and has to be involved. It's a marriage. And the more I want them to understand what I'm doing and have them on board, you actually see the emotional impact of the movie just with the quality of the music and the cinema and you know what the movie is right there. That's 90% of it. You know, what anybody says beyond that or sound effects or it'll be better in the mix is complete crap. You turned to me and said, oh my gosh, this is a film about sheets. It's a woman's... It, it's a woman's understanding of what we deal with on a daily basis. If you look at the film now, you'll see that. Towels, sheets, um, bedding, and searching for the teddy bear, rumbling through all parts of life in a house. It, was, it had a, a very strong maternal aspect to it. And what I love about the movie that it's so personal. Somehow the slow daily process of the events of filming it was more cathartic than if I had squelched the nightmare altogether. People often said that must have been so hard to film, and I said, no, thank God I did it. Because we didn't die, we lived. The main thing I remember about Jane was, was that bathroom scene. Because I was like, I was freaked out. I was like, I don't want to be naked in front of everybody. Well, he had his little bathrobe, and you may remember, I'm sure you do. He just took it right off and went right to the scene without one little bit of problem.
The scene that, um, in retrospect, has had a lot of effect on me is the scene that I had with, um, with Mike's son, Mako's son, the mentally handicapped um, boy, because um, my son has autism. And um, I started to see, as my son grew, and, and the more that I had to work with him, um, I really saw that my relationship with, with, with coming in and taking him in, in the film mm -hmm. and, you know, we, and, and our interac interaction, it completely mirrors a lot of what I have to do with my own son. I'm taking you home because I don't think your dad's going to be coming back. Oh, my God. I know it affected me at the, the time really deeply when we were doing the film. And I, I really connected with that scene, and um, probably more than any scene that, that, that we filmed. And I didn't really know why. And then mm -hmm. uh, years later, it, it all came for full circle, and, and I just went, wow, you know, there was something more going on here than, than, uh, than I could ever expect it. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a big. I had no idea, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was a good thing. Wow. Maya. Here we go. You're doing a job. All right. What kind of grace or existence or honor or survival or essence can they find? I always found in a way that the movie had a light in it. And the light was that no matter how bad it gets, there can be humanity. If you come close to death, you know, in some way that, you know, you bond or you make love or whatever, and it's, it's really not about ultimately your relationship, it's just that you're still alive. These two people are still alive. And they're human. Could you have written this if you hadn't had kids? Not the same way. No. No. No, I think there was in it. The details were probably small and spare that came literally from my children. But I think around them were emotions that I would not have known and that I therefore could not have conveyed. Whether or not you have children or not, this movie uh, hits you right in the forehead. You know, and, and, and in, a, in a special way, it actually doesn't hit you. It, you absorb it. And that fear of something irrational happening that will end it all um, is what I identified completely with the, with the mother in the story, except that she was much, especially as portrayed by Jane, she was much braver than I could ever be. I think mothers are that strong no matter what. I mean, mothers will lift up trucks to get their children out from under them. I mean, um, run in front of a moving ch a truck. Uh, this was the same thing with the nuclear holocaust. Until I had my children uh, some 20 years later, it didn't, it didn't really hit home. It didn't hit home for me. But when you relate it back to your children and you look at, you look at your kids growing up and you, you see how the promise is there and that promise of what their future is, the promise of what their goals and their dreams are about, that that can be cut short in a second, that that's what makes this special. It makes you readdress all of these issues and makes you want to stop it. October 30th, 1983, I guess it was a couple of years after. Or no, that was the same year? Yeah. Um, Dear President Reagan, sir, I hope that you will stop the bomb because I don't want to die. My friends don't want to die. And plus, you're an elderly gentleman, so you won't be on Earth much longer. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to. <laughs> you don't know how we feel about the bombs. Just imagine how it would feel if you were a kid and had to worry about nuclear war. I bet if you could see things like him, you wouldn't be doing the bombs right now because you know how it feels. Does your wife Nancy think the bombs are good too? Because I saw her on the drugs program, and she doesn't want kids to die from drugs, so why should we, she want them to die from bombs? Thank you and goodbye, U.S. citizen Lucas Haas, age seven and a half. P.S. 
I am in a movie that's in the theaters now, and it's called Testament. It's about a nuclear bomb, and you may, and may you please watch it. Goodbye, Lucas. P.S. <laughs> <laughs> My mama is typing this because I can't write that fast. That fast. Goodbye, Lucas. Wow. <laughs> Twenty years later, the film has a kind of burnished look. Um, it it's very straightforward. There's no, it's, it's, it's old-fashioned only in that there are long takes and no quick cutting and no um, special effects. It's a very plain film, but, it's, but what holds up is that there's an emotional honesty. Hi, Bob! All right now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I just, just gotta, gotta wake, wake up. up. Think you'll be able to keep up? I might. Sure you will. You wait and see. You'll turn around in a couple of years, and I won't even be able to keep up with you. You'll be flown right by. 